The traditions of Christmas run deep, and perhaps the greatest tradition in modern times is the seasonal airing of the classic film, It's a Wonderful Life, directed by Frank Capra, starring the young Jimmy Stewart. The film is one of the most beloved movies in American cinema history. First released in 1946, the film was nominated for five Oscars and it has been recognized by the American Film Institute as one of the 100 best American films ever made. And it's number one on the list of most inspirational films of all time. Besides Jimmy Stewart, the movie also featured some of the greatest stars in the Hollywood heavens. Donna Reed, remember her? The great Lionel Barrymore, who played the evil Mr. Potter. And Henry Travers as the clumsy angel Clarence Oddbody. It also launched the careers of other wonderful actors and actresses, including a very special artist who is with us tonight, Virginia Patton Moss. Virginia's motion picture career began when she was just a teenager working for Warner Brothers and Frank Capra while she was still a freshman at USC. Her first role in film was It's a Wonderful Life, where she played the role of Ruth Dakin Bailey, if you don't mind. The sister-in-law of George Bailey, uh, played by Jimmy Stewart, uh, and it was a role that would make her a part of motion, motion picture. i say, excuse me, motion picture history. After *It's a Wonderful Life*, Virginia would star in other films. But in 1949, she married Cruz W. Moss, a highly respected automotive executive, and they started a family. They've been married ever since, for more than 60 years. Mrs. Moss has always been a devoted supporter of the arts. She's a docent at the University of Michigan Museum of Art and is a member of the American Institute of Archaeology. She has served on the boards of both the Ann Arbor Society and the University of Michigan's Kelsey Museum of Archaeology. She is active in the University of Michigan School of Music where you'll find a Virginia Patton Moss display case in the Stearns Museum of Musical Instruments. For most people, a wonderful life is what Christmas is all about. And because of modern technology, that film has now been seen on every continent on Earth. As Virginia says, it's probably been, it's probably been in more homes than even Santa Claus. Sorry, guys. <laughs> but she may be right. So it's with great pleasure that I announce the winner of this year's St. Nicholas Institute Spirit of Christmas's Past, Present, and Future Award to Virginia Patton Moss. Thank you. What a beautiful, beautiful work of art. Isn't that gorgeous? And to think I'm going to take it home. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Father Joseph. Thank all of you for coming tonight. It is indeed a wonderful life. Uh, the thing that he just said about uh, being in uh, everybody's home at Christmas time, I just wanted to share a little bit about our Christmas one time. Our oldest son, Stevie, was about four and a half, and someone had told him that Mommy was going to be on TV. Well, our, our middle girl uh, was about two, and our youngest was a baby, and so they were in bed, but Mommy and Stevie and Daddy were all lined up to watch It's a Wonderful Life. Well, we watched it, and then all of a sudden, Stevie said, there's Mommy. There's Mommy right there. But that, that big man, that big tall man, he, he's, he's kissing Mommy, and he turned to Cruz, and he said, he's kissing Mommy, and I didn't think anybody kissed Mommy but Daddy, and he started, <laughs> And he started to cry, and so Cruz, he couldn't understand, and so Cruz took him in his lap, and he said, uh, well, Stevie, uh, that was play acting. You know, sometimes play acting, and um, it was just make-believe. Well, he quieted him down, but I'm not quite sure if we saw the rest of the movie. I can't remember. <laughs> Uh, it's a Wonderful Life was a privilege to be in, and it was a, more of a privilege to be working uh, for Mr. Capra. And I thought I'd tell you a little bit about him because he was a very unusual man. He was Catholic, Italian, and he was from Sicily. 
When he was five years old, his family received a letter from his older brother that had migrated to the university, to, uh, to the university, I'm thinking of U of M, um, to uh, America and urged them to come to America and gave them some money. But the letter came and nobody could read it because none of them could read. And they gave it to the priest and the priest read the letter. And at five years of age, Frank said, at that point in time, I decided I was going to become educated. They took the money and they came steerage. The family put them all together and came steerage, went through Ellis Island. And this was about 1890, something like that. Uh, and they took a, a railroad from New York out to California and uh, the, the older brother met them. And they all went to work and all pooled their resources. But Frank went to school right then. He started in first grade, went to first grade and worked his way through high school with the idea that he was going to go to college. And he worked three or four jobs, they all did, to, to contribute to the, uh, to the family. Well, he went to Caltech because he wanted to be an engineer, went through Caltech in a record number of times, was helped by the faculty because he was so brilliant and did such a good job. Uh, then along came the war, the First World War. And he volunteered in the First World War and they put him to work as a, 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 a teacher, a professor, uh, with the officers that he was teaching mathematics. The war was over, he couldn't find a job. They didn't hire engineers, they didn't hire teachers, he couldn't find anything. So he went into the want ads and he saw something that was really catching on at that point in time and it was motion pictures. They were silent motion pictures in a little motion picture and they were only about 10 or 15 cents to get in and it was all silent and was a new ad and they were advertising for somebody to help. So he, so he went in and bluffed his way didn't know a thing about motion pictures, bluffed his way because of his, uh, his uh, knowledge of uh, uh, Caltech. He uh, figured out how to splice, how to, how to put film together, how to do lighting, and just bluffed his way through all the way. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and he made it. He, one by one, he, he enlarged his uh, knowledge. He went to, to Columbia uh, Films, a, a big, uh, a big producing company, and uh, he started to get behind the camera, and then all of a sudden, sound came in. And he handled sound as well, with all the knowledge that he had had in Caltech, he enlarged, he wasn't ever very quiet. <laughs> and so he really became a, a, a director because he liked behind the camera. Well, the head of uh, uh, Columbia said, uh, uh, Capra, we're going to uh, make a movie about a bus. And uh, uh, there's a fellow that uh, is pretty good and, and might be a little temperamental. His name is Clark Gable, but you'll handle him. And uh, we want to borrow this gal from another studio, and her name is uh, Claudette Colbert. And she can be very hard to handle, but uh, go see what you can do. So Capra knocked on her door and, and uh, presented the thing. She said, absolutely nothing. I'm not going to do that. Uh, I'm going to go on vacation. It's four weeks to Christmas, and I'm going on vacation. And besides which, you can't afford me because you'd have to have double my salary before I'd even touch it. So he called up Cohen, and <laughs> he said, well, she wants double her salary, and she wants to finish it in four weeks. And he said, Capra, finish it in four weeks, double her salary, and get going. So uh, that bus picture. Uh, started out and became, uh, you can't, uh, it happened one night. Yeah, it happened one night. It happened one night. I get these th two things mixed up. It happened one night. And she gave Capra quite a hard time, didn't give uh, Gable too much of a time, but gave him a hard time. And it uh, happened to the scene where at that point in time, everybody was hitchhiking. This was 1934. Uh, it, people were hitchhiking and using the thumb, and Gable gets up and says, I can get us a ride. None, they didn't have any money, by the way. And they didn't have any money, and I'll get us a ride, and I use my thumb. And she was supposed to have said, your thumb, watch me. Well, she read the script, and she said, Capra, 
I am not lifting my skirt up to show my knee to get a ride on that automobile. Capra said, okay. So he got a, a, uh, a gal from the, the studio, another gal, with a, and put her in a dress that was a duplication of, uh, of Claudette's dress and shot the scene with her lifting her skirt. Not very far. You understand this was back in the days when they didn't do. Can you imagine, you, if you've ever seen the motion picture, it, they, they had these two unrelated people in a motel. Motels were absolutely new at the time, a motel, and they only had a blanket hanging between them and they weren't married. Can you imagine that, sh that scene shot today? Well, anyway, <laughs> so, uh, so uh, uh, she was supposed to, uh, so they shot the scene with the substitute uh, girl, and she said, Claudette said, Capra, that's just terrible. That, that woman doesn't even have a good leg. She said, I have a beautiful leg. He said, well, she said, shoot it again. <laughs> So if you've ever seen that motion picture, you'll see that is Claudette. Well, they put it in the can and they put it out. And the next uh, 1935, the next February, uh, it's a, uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, the. Uh, it happened one night. Yeah, no, uh, it uh, it uh, the, the Academy Awards. Awards. Thank you. This is my my prompter over here, my husband. <laughs> The Academy Awards, and my golly, it swept the Academy Awards. First time had anything had ever happened. It got Best Actor, Best Actress, Best Producer, Best uh, Director, Best Story, and uh, the Best Motion Picture. Well, that held for 35 years. It was, the, it, it was a, can you imagine sweeping the Academy Award? Even today, even today, how many, how many motion pictures sweep the Academy Award? Well. That set his uh, star in the sky, and the next thing he did was Mr. Deeds goes to uh, Mr. Deeds goes to town. Remember, uh, and with with a, all of his motion pictures, had some kind of a message in the background. And at that point in time, he he went back to Cohen and said, "I'm not going to have my name. I'm, my name is going to be over the motion picture." You saw uh, here it was uh, Frank Capra's uh, motion picture. Frank Capra said it's a wonderful type. He was the name over the title, and he gave his autobiography the name above the title. Well, he, he went to fantastic motion pictures. He, Mr. Smith goes to Washington, uh, you can't take it with you. And then the one that I don't know whether any of you remember it or not, but I wish they'd really bring it back. It was a Hilton story about lost horizons. And it was Shangri-La. Up in, in Tibet, it was, a, it was an idealistic thing. And if they'd bring it back, I think it would be a big hit, but they, you know, I don't know whether they ever will or not, but sometime maybe somebody can ask for it. Well, and time marched on, and uh, of course we were plunged into the war, and it was the Second World War. And Capra uh, volunteered his work uh, to the uh, United States government, and he became a colonel and made a lot of movie, uh, motion pictures for the uh, United States. And Jimmy Stewart uh, volunteered, and he was a he was a uh, uh, in the Air Force, and he was a major. And uh, interestingly enough, you know, Jimmy Stewart would never never talk about his military career. Never. If, if they interviewed him, they would always get up to it, and they would ask him about it, but he would never talk about his military career. And he and Capra would uh, talk about what they would do and discuss and maybe what they would do after the war, but they never came to any conclusion. But Capra came to a conclusion. He was going to get out of getting into a, uh, a big company. He was going to make his own company. And he started three of his cronies together, and he was the president, and these three men, Briskin, Cap uh, Stevenson, and Weiler, two very great directors, and Briskin was a uh, 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 he, he was the money bags, he kept the money, he was supposed to keep the money together. And uh, they started a new film company called Liberty Films and took the, the, uh, the Liberty Bell as their logo. And then the big problem was what they were going to do to find a, a uh, vehicle. So he read and read and read a lot of things until one time, until at one point, they gave him a, a, a script, a very small script as a matter of fact, and it was called The Greatest Gift. He said, that's it, that's it. And he described the, the, uh, the, the plot to Jimmy Stewart, and Jimmy Stewart said, I'm in. 
<laughs> and they changed the name to It's a Wonderful Life, and that was the beginning of it. And that's where I came into it, because when he was seeking uh, people to flesh out the, the, uh, the cast, I read for him, and uh, he signed me. And I was the only person he ever signed. He was the, I was the only woman he ever signed. So the ball, the, uh, the ball started rolling, and he uh, first he took the, I'm banging this, aren't I? Uh, first he took the, uh, the old lot of uh, RKO way out in Encino, and he built a three block uh, uh, Bedford Falls. And it was everything in that, uh, in that uh, three blocks, three and a half blocks. It was the, uh, the downtown, the bank, the savings and loan, all the houses, the bridge where Clarence jumped off, the whole thing was shot there. Except for two other places, and that, if you remember, if you've seen the movie, and I assume some of you have, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the high school play where they were all dancing and then the high school gym floor moves over and they all fall into the swimming pool. Well, that was uh, Beverly Hills High School. Then he borrowed it for that. And then my scene was uh, shot up at, uh, uh, at uh, uh, blank again. Uh, Pasadena. Pasadena. See, my, he, he's so good he remembers and I can't remember. <laughs> Pasadena. So uh, in the meantime, uh, Capra would do the shooting probably by sequence, and uh, it came the, the uh, uh, the scene that uh, Jimmy Stewart was tramping through the snow and uh, the typical way of Hollywood of treating snow was uh, untoasted cornflakes because they were white and when you stepped on them they crunched. Well that wasn't good enough for Capper. He wanted that scene for Jimmy Stewart to be really cold so he, he uh, went to the uh, special effects man and he said what can you do about it? So the special effects man devised and invented at that point in time a huge pillar of ice and he had some kind of a, um, a, a, a shaver, a, a blade that would shave off the ice and blow it, making it into snow because he had an enormous fan behind and it looked like snow and if you've ever would see the motion picture again, it was, Jimmy was cold because he was really cold. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, was, uh, it was fine the first night. They always shot at night because it was uh, July by then and it was cooler. And uh, they, were all, they were all right uh, the first night, but the second night they ran out of ice. And so he had to borrow ice from an ice house a couple of uh, places away. And uh, ice houses were, were at that time, we all had ice houses in the 1940s. And we have one down in Ann Arbor right now. I understand there's an ice house, a remnant of an ice house, right down in, in Ann Arbor before you go west over the railroad tracks. Well, it came time to pack up and go up to uh, Pasadena. And, uh, of course, this was a big deal in Pasadena, uh, having a motion picture company move in with all the trailers for the dressing rooms and, and the, uh, the cameras and th uh, that kind of thing. Well, um, at that point in time, and, and it still is, uh, a, a, um, a motion picture actor or actress had to learn their lines, be on time, and stay on their marks. Well, staying on their marks would meant that when you rehearse a scene, as you saw coming off the, uh, the train, uh, you rehearsed the scene, the director was happy, you were happy, and then you would leave and sit down and wait because your stand-in would come in and you would be lit because you'd get the, you'd get the, uh, uh, the, the lights right and th particularly the sound. And they would make marks where you were supposed to, as you saw me walking, I had to, not obviously, <laughs> obvious, but I had to hit this mark because I was lit for that spot and there was a mark on the popcorn stand, I think, too. Anyway, so uh, you, had to, you had to stay in the mark. Well. While they were lighting it, and my stand-in was there, and Uncle Billy was there, and all the rest, I was sitting down there thinking about what I was going to do in that theme, because I was dressed as a young matron at the time. I had a hat, I had a suit, and I had white gloves. I was coming to meet my new in-laws. Well, I was going to eat buttered popcorn with white gloves. <laughs> we rehearsed it, and the cameraman, uh, 
uh, Frank didn't say anything about it. His assistant didn't say anything about it. The cameraman didn't say anything about it. And I was sitting there while they were doing all this lighting, and I thought, what am I going to do? I'm going to get the popcorn all over those gloves. And if they pull up for a close-up, I'm going to get buttered popcorn gloves. So I thought, well, no, I think what I'll do is I'll just uh, pretend everybody eats buttered popcorn with gloves, and they all get butter on them. So that's the way I ended it. And in the meantime, when all this was going on in the background, somebody from Pasadena, one of those onlookers that had clustered around, uh, went up to the popcorn stand and wanted to buy a bag of popcorn. <laughs> and somebody said, no, you don't understand. That's a prop for the movie. <laughs> So it was, a, it was a marvelous experience, and Mr. Capper, in his uh, autobiography, said that uh, It's a Wonderful Life was the best motion picture I ever produced and directed. And other people have said that the message in It's a Wonderful Life is the most wonderful motion picture that has ever been produced. And I was a, a, a privilege to be in it, but the idea was that it sent a message at that point in time, Capra understood that we were coming off of a war, we were, we were, we were in terrible shape as a country, and it had to, they had to have, it had to have some, some stimulus, some, some, some point, at that point in time, we had to have something in our life. As Clarence did with his uh, bell, when Clarence got the, the wings, he got his wings, and right now, Go get them, Capra. <laughs> it is, it is indeed a wonderful life. Virginia, Clarence Oddbody got his wings. The symbolism of this particular uh, Crystal Award is you'll see this clear vertical piece with pewter relief image of St. Nicholas. That represents the spirit of Christmas surrounding the earth. And you're getting your wings tonight, believe it or not, Help. because we have represented nine pairs of angel wings. So we have the nine choirs of angels. So Virginia has just gotten her wings. Right. 